Fortyunbox.com here, and we're going to be checking out this video from the Russian spy, Andre Jik, and go and find out why he's a million dollars in debt. And by the way, he's not a Russian spy. Maybe. So let's get right into it. Full screen. Oh, I finally did it. <laughs> can't believe it. This is terrifying. But I finally got myself into debt, which is a place I never thought I'd be because I've always been so afraid to borrow money my whole life. I never want to feel like I owe someone money. But here we are. This is not clickbait. I actually did borrow a small loan of a million dollars from my father. No, I'm kidding. My parents are not rich. By the way, for those that don't know, what's pretty cool about Andre Jick is that he's actually recorded this, but he actually paid off his parents' house. Like, once he started to make, like, really good money from YouTube, he paid off their house. Like, that's a pretty amazing thing. But let's continue. But I did take out the loan, and I realize I'm fully aware that borrowing a million dollars is not relatable to anyone ever. But, thankfully, you don't have to borrow that much money for this strategy to be effective. And if you watch this video all the way through with an open mind, hopefully I can prove this will work with a lot less money as well. But I also want to be realistic and say that just because this works for me does not mean... Amor, because... Like, there's a reason why he was probably afraid of debt. And the reason why a lot of people should actually be way more afraid of debt than they actually are. Right? Because a lot of people have this disconnect with debt where they view it as there's no risk, regardless of what they use this debt for and that is not the case and especially if you're not really good at managing money getting into any kind of debt can really screw you over by the way this frozen frame <laughs> kind of sucks sorry it'll depend on a lot of things which i'll explain later in the video the reason this works for me is because every single month we're seeing headlines like this inflation breaks the 40 year record high even gas in California has reached over seven dollars a gallon. Everything is becoming more expensive. Food is becoming more expensive. By the way, the average gas price, I think, as of right now, is about four dollars a gallon. Like right above four dollars a gallon, which is crazy. And there's some predictions going that the average gas price, like per gallon, might get to seven dollars a gallon or even ten dollars a gallon. Rent is becoming more expensive. Everything thanks to Considering what's going on in Europe, I really do believe that inflation is only going to get worse. And this just means that we are forced to invest our money. But the question is, where do we invest that money? So the first place I looked at investing my money is, of course, the stock market. And if you're somebody who's buying individual stocks right now, like a lot of people are, especially those high-flying tech stocks, you are down something like 16% year to date. That is the NASDAQ index. And here's the thing, like a lot of people who invest into single stocks need to be very careful. Like unless you have the time and also the patience to really study a few single stocks and really understand the companies behind them, you really should not be getting involved into single stocks because more than likely you're going to be in like the 90 plus percent of stock traders that lose their money. If you're somebody who likes to buy smaller companies or small caps like the ones you'd find from the Russell 2000 index, you're down something like 12%. I second that. I think this is a great idea to like just basically automate your investing into the S&P 500 because the reality of investing is that the majority of people don't understand anything right? They don't understand the companies. They don't understand what they're actually buying. They don't understand whether or not a company is even good or even morally good. Like they just don't understand. So if you just simplify it and you basically show historical data of the S&P 500 and showing that basically every single year on average, it beats inflation. Why wouldn't you put your money into that in an automated way? Because here's the thing, right? Due to compound interest, Putting the equivalent of like a car payment into the S&P 500 after a few decades will quite literally turn you into a multi-millionaire. 
all because of compound interest. It's crazy when you really think about it. And this is also why we really push hard into people not going into debt so that they can have more money to invest stress-free. Because here's the thing. He's going to get into debt. I'm assuming that is probably because he refinanced his home to put money into the stock market or whatever, possibly, or even crypto. Because for those that don't know, he's a crypto millionaire as well. The thing is, like, he still needs to factor in the risk. Like, the numbers might make sense for him, and we'll, f- we'll find out later on as to the exact reason why he did it. But you always have to factor in risk, no matter what you do. And that is down. Yeah, it most likely is him like refinancing his house because for those that don't know or may not know, he originally bought his, I think, 700000 plus house in cash, right? And of course, because of the crazy house market, his house is probably worth over a million dollars now, right? Still, you still got to factor in the risk of having that much debt. By the way, side note, awesome Pikachu shirt. them to not get involved in nuclear weapons and how many billions of dollars are we going to be sending over there think about that for a second by the way in terms of the whole gas thing it would alleviate a lot of pressure in the states if we started to drill for our own gas and yet we're not doing that we're actually moving from russia to more middle east countries to buy their gas. It's crazy when you really think about it. By the way, for anyone who ends up stumbling upon this, go check out the usdebtclock.org because it is insane. If you were to do like a deep dive, which I did like weeks or even months ago, it's disgusting how much debt the United States actually has.
which by the way also means that if Russia does end up actually truly getting kicked out of SWIFT, right? That's a very good sign for cryptocurrencies to like a heavy, heavy degree, okay? Because that is one of the easiest ways for international trade that people could rely on, like the USDC, right? A stable coin, all these different stable coins, any one of these countries can literally just dump massive amounts of money into it and then just conduct business still kind of using the U.S. dollar by using these, you know, U.S.-backed currencies in a sense, right? It's, it's really crazy because if the United States does ban SWIFT, well, ban Russia from SWIFT, it really just hurts the United States, which is kind of funny. For our own debt. And that's just a complicated way of saying we need the world to need dollars. Otherwise, we pay the price of inflation sooner. So for all of those reasons, I don't think inflation is transitory. Now let's just take Goldman Sachs' estimate at face value that inflation will be 3.7% at the end of this year. Since I borrowed the money at 2.6%, the difference between those two is 1.1% in my pocket. Plus, because I converted that debt into an asset that will hopefully go up in value, I get to make money that way, and I get to make passive income if I rent it out and I make some cash flow. So I'm protected on all three sides. And because this debt can't be margin called away from me like it could in the stock market, I'm protected in that way as well. So with the technical and the number talk out of the way, let me just talk to you like an old person. I just bought a house. Which is crazy because I bought a house in February of last year. I'm living in it. I remodeled it. I love the house. And I'm not buying another one. By the way, his house is actually super beautiful, by the way. It's because I feel like my hand is forced. I have to leverage the money I have to protect the value I have against inflation. And the safest way I can find to do that is to buy more real estate, which is something I need more of anyway. This is a crazy world we live in because again, never in a million years can I imagine me buying another house in basically one year. But I also realize that this strategy is finagling, basically. But either way, once I learned this technique, that's exactly what I did to get my offer accepted on the house I just recently purchased. The second thing I've learned is that the house sold for exactly what I offered and not for over asking like what we were told. The reason I didn't get the house is because the seller's listing agent is what's called a double agent, which means they have less of an incentive to accept my offer. They represent both the buyer and the seller. They get the full commission check. But going with my offer meant splitting it with my real estate agent. I don't know why that's allowed, but that's a conflict of interest in real estate that I hope will change. The takeaway is that if you ever go to sell your house, make sure that the listing agent you're working with is not a double agent because you want to make sure you are shown the best offer for your house. That is also extremely shady, which kind of just basically shows you that, like, in terms of, like, selling one of your biggest assets, you should probably do some due diligence. There were a few other things I learned which I thought was a little sketchy, like the fact that the buyer created an LLC two days before the listing happened, and they got approved on a loan for a two-day-old LLC, which doesn't make sense because they don't have two years of proof of income, and banks don't like to lend to LLCs, which raised more questions than answered. Maybe the listing agent was somehow related to the buyer. I don't know, but what I do know is that the most important thing is this. Make sure you have a steady flow of income and at least six months to one year of an emergency fund to pay off any kinds of expenses or debts. I agree with this completely, but the thing is, for the majority of people, you really shouldn't be getting into debt because you are typically not factoring in risk. Right, and that's the thing that people really need to understand. And Andre Jick is in a very interesting situation, unlike other people, where he's potentially making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month, okay, which is vastly different than other people. And not only that, he could easily go months technically not really working and still be making money, 
still be bringing in crazy amounts of money. So he's in a very interesting situation, unlike the average person. Reward ratio is worth it because of the high demand, the low supply, because I had access to cheap debt, and during a time of high inflation, I think this is super beneficial. Now, this is definitely risky, but I want to stay invested in the markets, even when the markets seem a little scary, because scared money doesn't make money, which is the ultimate lesson I've learned so far. Love you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you back here. Now, the good thing about Andre Jick is that he's very realistic in his viewpoints, right? Even though I disagree with him in terms of like, Use, like utilizing debt in this way, mainly because how big of his audience, there's going to be so many people who watch this video, not pay attention to his warnings, which is sad, but there's going to be people not paying attention to the literal warnings that he has inside his video and end up basically yellowing it in massive amounts of debt, right? And just something like crypto and just something like the stock market with like single stocks or penny stocks and all this crazy stuff, right? And that's a sad reality of someone in his position with a massive audience. There's going to be a certain percentage of people who watch his stuff that don't pay attention to every aspect of what he's saying and ends up making bad financial choices because they just don't pay attention, right? But... Feel free to give your thoughts. I understand why he's doing it, but also here's another thing that you gotta understand too, right? Like, let's just do this. So Andre Jick, right, his, he's a YouTuber, right? He's typically more so personal finance and crypto, and he, like, like these like estimated monthly earnings are extremely low, right? I'm pretty certain he makes more like a hundred, a hundred and thirty thousand dollars a month or something like that. Pretty close to that. Because I think his CPMs are probably around the twenty to even forty like between the twenty to forty dollar per one thousand view range, right? Not to mention any sponsorships that he has or affiliates that he has or any sort of products he might end up selling. Like he easily has like a five million dollar plus per year business just from his YouTube channel, right? So his situation is unlike other people's. And the thing to really understand is what, like the last time he had under a million views, so you can say like under like thirty, forty thousand dollars was let's see a pretty darn long time ago. Not even then. Around March of 2019 was the last time he was under a million video views per month. And so you could basically understand he is making more than a doctor and probably will always make more than a doctor from now on if everything goes well with his content every single year, which means he could technically afford a mortgage on a $1 million house pretty easily, especially if he has a lot of cash inside the bank as like an emergency fund, he could easily afford, technically speaking, a mortgage for a $1 million house. The question is, should he, right? And his viewpoint, he should, because he thinks there's better use for that money and is perfectly fine with thinking like that. But you still always got to factor in risk. And he's apparently okay with the risk that comes with it. And he even says it is risky, which I respect a lot. I really respect someone who blatantly tells people like, hey, I am going down this path. This can be risky and it's not for everyone, right? Because the reality of the situation, a lot of people might try to do something like he's doing but are going to get themselves basically almost like drowning in an ocean because they highly overestimate their capabilities and underestimate the actual risk factor of getting into like seven figures of debt or getting into a lot of debt. And the reality of the situation, you know, for him, a million dollars is probably not really anything right, for him, 
So what is the actual ratio of $1 million to his total net worth? I don't know, right? If he were to ever like explain his like the ratio of this $1 million in debt versus his actual total net worth, I think it'd be kind of like interesting to see. But he's also a person that could easily buy this house with cash. I'm like 100% certain that he's also able to buy this in cash. But to each their own. I just find it to be more on the riskier side, even though it is a mortgage for a house. It's still on the risky side, especially with the specific type of loan that he has.